Yeah, I think. Uh, du during this pandemic, uh, schools have had a tough time uh, coping with the new situation. But uh, it is very clear that those schools who have an, a, a good curriculum, who have a reliable staff, who have good textbooks, who have already accustomed their students to working in a regular way, to evaluations, tests, if you want, uh, they do well also during the pandemic. Maybe a bit less well, but they do well. So there's no really, there's not really uh, a new situation. Uh, it's a difficult situation, but uh, the kind of qualities that make a school good uh, also make the schools good during the pandemic. I would like to uh, comment upon two books uh, that have been published this year of pandemic. 2020. Two books from the United States. And the first one is by E. D. Hirsch and is called How to Educate a Citizen. Uh, the author is worried about the situation in the United States, about social fragmentation, conflict. And he says, why, why don't people look more to schools? Schools can be healing. And uh, he speaks about a coherent curriculum, well chosen, developed, demanding, and how this uh, could help both teachers and students. And he speaks especially about the first year of, of, of the obligatory school, the, the elementary school and middle school. Uh, and um, what is his, his main uh, object, his main um, figure of speech is the classroom as a community, as a speech community, as a knowledge community uh, for developing the students into citizens. Uh, and what he says is you, you, you must have a coherent curriculum so that the students each year know more and more and have a better and better vocabulary so that they understand more and that they understand the same things in order to form a community, which will be like a, a small society and will accustom them to living in society. Uh, what he has done with his, what he calls a core curriculum, uh, he has, uh, he has um, accomplished a small miracle, and that is to make uh, schools in difficult districts get very good results too, because there are more than a thousand schools that follow his core curriculum program. And what he suggests is really very simple, very traditional if you want to. It's a good curriculum with a lot of history, geography, literature, reading, vocabulary studies, mathematics, etc. A good or a good curriculum, well developed. But what is different, maybe, is that he makes the teachers adhere to the curriculum so that there are no overlapping and no voids for the students. They they go along nicely and they learn more and more. Uh, he's especially happy that the that minority students do very well in his classrooms because they hear in school everything they need to get along. So this is the first book I wanted to talk about. And the second one is also from the United States, as I said, by Thomas Sowell. And Thomas Sowell is an economist. And he uh, presents something which has uh, similarities to the program that Hearst presents, but his point of view is more from the economic side, which is natural uh, given his background. And he has found a bit by chance that the city of New York is a kind of laboratory for uh, education. Uh, in New York, uh, in the public school system, uh, students are mainly Afro-American or Spanics, Spanish speaking Hispanics. They have more or less the same social and economic status, and they even study in the same kind of buildings. Uh, when I say in the same kind of buildings, uh, I, um, 
we, we are getting to the point that Thomas Sowell wants to make. And it is because he can compare the students who study in the public school system altogether and the students who study in charter schools, which are, which are in a certain way within the public school sector because they are paid for by the taxpayers. Uh, but they have other kinds of teachers and other kinds of administration. So these students, once more, often Afro-American and Hispanics, they study in the same kind of buildings because in New York City, the, the, it's so expensive to, to construct new buildings that charter schools often use uh, empty classrooms uh, in the same buildings as other kinds of schools. So uh, the, the important and interesting uh, feature is that these children, these students, they take the same test in the third grade and the eighth grade, a test in, a test in English and mathematics, the test uh, that all students in the city of New York have to take. Uh, and so uh, Sawal can compare. They are exactly the same background, exactly the same building. Um, they get the same kind of money. Even the charter school students really cost a, lit, uh, a little less, really. But the interesting feature is that uh, the charter school students get much higher results. It, the, the difference can be between 70% uh, of the children getting uh, one of the four top layers of uh, results uh, and only 10% in the ordinary public schools uh, in English uh, and in mathematics. So, so the miracle of what he found is that uh, what is important in schools and in school quality is not the student's extraction uh, economically or ethic, uh, ethnically or, or, or whatever. It's not the student's extraction. It's not the place where they study. It is not really the, the money invested in schools because the, the students who do better have got less um, investment in them. What is left? Well, the, what is left is how the teachers teach and how the students study. And of course, that is what is important. Uh, so what the charter school students do, they, they use the time well, they do their homework, and they get better and better. So their parents, uh, parents uh, of school children in New York, are queuing in order to get their children into charter schools, but there are not enough places in charter schools. So they, have, they often have lotteries to decide what child can enter the charter school. And this situation with the lottery is also very interesting because that says that there is no creaming off the best students, a, a kind of charge that has often been made towards the, the charter schools. These students are exactly like other students. And for example, one school called the Success School uh, takes each year 3,000 students, but there are some 14,000 students who have applied to the schools but cannot be accepted because there are not enough places. So there are 14,000 students in ordinary schools who would be charter school students if they could, but they get uh, results that are way below the other results. So all of this, what, what Thomas Sowell is saying, the, the good, the good um, news here is that uh, with, if you do this seriously, if you have a good curriculum, if you have teachers who adhere to the curriculum, if you uh, uh, organize schools so that students really use their time and do their homework regularly, you can get very good results within the, the framework of schooling that we have today. So the question we all 
ask ourselves is why do not everyone, why doesn't everyone copy the schools who have, who have such success? Well, there's no simple answer, but maybe it's important to remember that the, the, the main problem might not be with the students, but with the, the adults. It's the adults who do not permit schools, more schools to open that schools of a kind that parents and students want. So it's, it's an adult problem. It's a social and political and pedagogical problem among the adults. That might be uh, really good news. <laughs> if that is good news or bad news, it's difficult to say, but it's solvable. If we want to solve it, we can solve it. And, and that should be uh, a, a positive thing. So just wrapping up this, this uh, short, um, uh, these reflections upon the time that we are in, is that pan the pandemic is difficult uh, for everyone, but what is a solid and good work in education in ordinary times is also solid and good work in, in, in a pandemic. And the second thing is that our problems in education are solvable. We just have to go about them the right way. But there are models that we can follow and it can be done. So uh, we will end on this positive note.